Thank you, Aria. Good afternoon. Last week at the Munich Strategic Conference, former Secretary of State John Kerry vehemently defended the Iran nuclear deal and strongly criticized Netanyahu for misrepresenting and um, distorting uh, the nuclear deal. This was a sad statement, so divorced from contemporary realities uh, in the Middle East. After more than 10 years uh, since uh, the signing of the nuclear deal, we could have some measure of how successful it, his, uh, it has been and what uh, could or should be done in the future uh, about it. I uh, don't want to say anything about Trump's presidency, but given that Kerry's statement, we can just imagine what would have been the situation today had Hillary Clinton won the presidential elections. The nuclear deal was a major turning point in both regional and international politics, and it, and it uh, has created a disastrous chain reactions. And I'm saying a turning point in both regional and international politics because there is a clear linkage between the two. Anything that is happening in the region has had effects on uh, international politics. I can now summarize briefly the immediate results of the deal. First, it legitimized Iran as a regional power, having both interest and capabilities to influence Middle Eastern politics. It immediately released billions of dollars for the Iranian economy, not necessarily to improve the standard of living, but mainly to finance Iranian aggressive behavior in the Middle East. Um, it contributed to the modernization of Iran's conventional army. We talk a lot about, about nuclear issues, but Iran is modernizing uh, its conventional uh, military with the help of Russia. And speaking of Russia, the deal almost immediately uh, inspired the Russian intervention in Syria. There is a huge difference between uh, Russian, the Russian approach to Iran and Syria before and after the deal. And the Russian intervention contributed to the refugee crisis in Europa, in Europe because, because Russian and Syrian bombing uh, created a massive movement of refugees to Europe. This is, in my judgment, was was a revenge, a Russian revenge, against the EU policy on the Ukraine uh, crisis. And finally, the deal created the European rush to gold in Iran. So many, many companies uh, went to Tehran uh, to make deals. The issues that were left out of the deal were even more important than those that were included in the deal. Missiles and missiles experiments and experimentation, the aggressive behavior in different parts of the Middle East, including military interventions in both Syria and Yemen, and uh, sponsorship of terrorism, including uh, terrorist organizations such as Hezbollah and Hamas. If you look at the record of the last two and a half years, we see that the Obama's administration assumptions about the positive contributions of the deal, most of them have crumbled. Obama assumed that the deal will moderate Iranian politics, will help the moderates in Tehran to win the battle against uh, the conservatives and the radicals. It assumed that the huge resources released by the deal would be invested in, in domestic economic progress. It also assumed uh, about regional matters that uh, Iran will uh, help to defeat ISIS. 
So the priority in American policy has been the defeat of ISIS, not thinking enough about the day after, especially in Syria. Uh, it assumed that um, Syria, since, since uh, Iran is such a major player in Syria, uh, Iranian uh, cooperation is needed to end the war and, um, and, and determine and help to determine uh, the peace, the after Assad peace uh, in, in Syria. So the, the summary of all these assumptions has been that the deal will moderate Iran both domestically and regionally, will contribute to stabilize the region, and also eventually perhaps to regime change in Iran. If the, if the regime in Iran uh, changes, to a more liberal uh, government, then the issue, the nuclear issue becomes less important. Because the question is who controls nuclear weapons? Radical Islam or a liberal uh, democracy? In terms of, of the international dimension, this is also an interesting case study that deserves a long lecture in itself. So here the Obama administration assumed from the beginning and I know that because I had many conversations with American policymakers on this issue. Syria will become the Vietnam of America. This, uh, the, Syrian the, the Russian intervention in Syria, it's not bad for us. It's good for us. Because Russia is going to, uh, is going to be involved in such a way as to compromise its economic, military, and political uh, capabilities. And of course, this... What did I say? No, America's Vietnam. America's Vietnam. That Syria will become to Russia as Vietnam became to America. So if we look at the major threats to global uh, peace and stability of the last, say, a few years, the number one threat uh, has been uh, radical Islam violence and terrorism, and the second, nuclear proliferation. And Iran is a major uh, sponsor and, and promoter of both. So if you will look at the, what, what has happened in the last two years, we don't see much progress towards stability, perhaps we see exactly the opposite. Now how the Middle East is also linked to global issues, in this particular case, to nuclear proliferation. In my judgment, there has been a clear linkage between the nuclear deal and North Korean ambitious nuclearization program. North Korea has been collaborating with Iran on a, on, for several years on a number of issues, missiles, nuclear technology, and also Iran has been, uh, North Korea has been observing the approaches of the international community, the United States and the great powers to Iran and concluded that, that uh, it is free to move on with, the nucle with nuclear bombs and missile experimentation without much danger. And so and Iran is now also watching the, the world, especially the United States, approach to North Korea. And my argument is if uh, the United States and the West fail to block North Korean race to the bomb, they are likely to fail also to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. And this is going to be the end of the nuclear proliferation regime. If we look uh, also, now we go back to the Middle East, and um, what, uh, what Trump has completely changed is the perception of friends and enemies. For Obama, Iran, after the deal, will become an ally. For Trump, Iran remains an enemy. There's another term which is called frenemy, which means the combination of being a friend and an enemy, like China to the United States. But in this particular case, it could be either ally or an enemy. But 
uh, the, despite the definition, the clear definition of who is a friend and who is an enemy and trying to rebuild American relations with its traditional allies, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, Gulf states, and Israel, which Obama almost completely destroyed. He was quoting Iran instead. Trump's strategy uh, for the Middle East and for Iran has been inconsistent. Yes, he used force against uh, the, the Air Force base from which Syrian uh, combat airplanes uh, uh, took off to, uh, to use chemical weapons against, against Syrians. Yes, he, he, used, he, he, he launched a, a number of missiles. And now he attacked uh, 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 the Assad and perhaps Russian uh, proxies in northwest, uh, uh, northwest Syria. But uh, beyond that, we see that although Trump confronted the nuclear deal, he has ignored the, Syri the, the Iranian-Russian domination of uh, Syria. And this can be easily seen in that infamous uh, understanding or agreement they, that they signed on, um, on um, southwest Syria. So uh, the May 12th, which was mentioned here earlier, May 12th, the deadline for a decision on the Iranian nuclear deal is going to be a major test for American policy uh, on Iran, on the Middle East, and also on international uh, politics. The forces that negotiated and concluded the deal were the United States, Europe, and Russia, primarily. And I think a similar coalition is needed to stop, to stop Iran. When uh, Trump said, you have a few, when he refused to certify Iranian, um, Iranian compliance with the deal, and sent, uh, sent it to Congress, this was a message not to Iran. Because Iran is not going to open uh, the agreement, is not going to negotiate anything. This was a message to the EU, to Europe. And the message is this, either you cooperate with me on certain elements in the deal and on the issues left out of the deal, then I'm withdrawing from the deal. This was like an ultimatum. And I think that Europe may agree and have a common interest with the United States, for example, on missile experimentation. Emmanuel Macron, for example, said that he, he is very worried about Iranian missile experimentation. But it's not clear whether Europe, that in the last few years, has looked the other way and now is heavily invested in Tehran, would do anything to, uh, to cooperate with the United States. There's another option which Trump initially thought would be the case. He wanted to achieve a deal with Putin. And that deal included Syria and the Middle East. Now Russia wants, Russia from the beginning, intervened in Syria in order to diminish American power and influence. But what is important for Russia is Ukraine. So when Trump talked about a deal, he meant some resolution and American concessions and European concessions in the Ukraine in return for some Russian concessions in Syria. The problem with that, there are two problems. One is the Russian intervention in the elections uh, in the United States because anything that Trump would do with Putin would be, especially in agreement, especially concessions, would be immediately interpreted as part, as a response, as a concession given in return for the Russian intervention. And second is, uh, the, and, and the second problem is um, that uh, Europe may not go along because for Europe, the Ukraine crisis is perhaps more important than other crises or, or the Middle East. So the chances of 
stopping Iran, North Korea, and Russia are not good. And the key for that is U.S. leadership. And the timing for that is May 12th. If this date is um, extended, or if uh, there's no movement at all, this would indicate another proof for American leadership failure in the international system. Uh, uh, Hillel said, said something in the morning, Hillel Frisch, uh, about, about great powers and about the United States. He said that the United States by far has the strongest military. The question is about will. But the third component, the third criteria needed to, for a state to become a great state is a vision. We don't have yet, and I don't know when are we going to have, a clear strategic vision, especially for, uh, for the world and also for the Middle East, because a vision is uh, important to chart the ways, the strategic ways, for a great power to navigate. May 12 is an opportunity to exercise, again, American great leadership in the Middle East and the world. Thank you.